Welcome to Reflections, a program where we discuss Christian values and virtues for the transformation of the Christian individual and his or her society. Um, this is the second time we're having the opportunity of having our studio, Bishop Godfrey Honor, uh, Bishop of the Catholic Diocese of Onsuka. Uh, the last time we met, we discussed the challenges that face the church today. Uh, some people call it Pentecostalism, but I say that this is what we are having is a real confusion of identity of, uh, of Christians and a confusion of the central mysteries of Christianity. Whereas the cross, Jesus dying on the cross and the foolishness of the cross that is wiser than human wisdom, uh, St. Paul says, uh, this is the center of the Christian message. But there are people who think that miracles constitute the center of the Christian message. And people advertise, come for miracles rather than come and be saved in Christ. Rather than come and have your sins forgiven that you may be saved in Christ. So this is what we discussed the last time. And uh, uh, Bishop Honor concluded the discussion by saying that this thing has very strong cultural roots. The confusion we are seeing in Christian practice today have very strong cultural roots. Today, we would like to discuss more of that culture. Uh, like I say, I have Bishop Honor with me in the studio, and we are going to be looking at the quality of Christian practice today in our society and where culture is involved and how actually perhaps the gospel should be a principal agent in the forming of our culture. Welcome, Bishop. And uh, um, I now uh, ask you to further enlighten us on the influence of culture um, in uh, the Christian practice or lack of Christian practice today, uh, or the influence of the gospel in forming our culture, which I believe is what is supposed to be, that um, the message of Christ, is, which transcends all cultures, supposed to help form a Christian culture for the people that um, are 50, 60 percent Christians. You go to parts of the country that are 98 percent Christian. Is their culture, has their culture been sufficiently penetrated by the gospel? Culture is dynamic, they say. So you really don't have a static set of practices that we call culture. Culture should be dynamic. A people's language, a people's music, a people's way of dressing, a people's way of speaking, a people's way of behaving, all that gamut together is called culture. To what extent has the gospel of Christ influenced our way of life? Uh, or to what extent is our way of life reflective of the gospel that we preach, of the gospel that we believe? Um, let our viewers hear you. Thank you very much, Father. I must start by saying, as you rightly mentioned, that culture is dynamic. But before then, you have to permit me some time to attempt some clarification, because culture is a very complex reality. And even experts in the field have some difficulty in defining exactly what, what, culture, what is. culture is. As far back as in the 1960s, we already had up to 150 definitions of culture. So I wouldn't bore our viewers with any form of definition, but I would want to point out that there is a subjective dimension of culture and an objective dimension of culture, and I will explain. By the subjective dimension of culture, I mean that aspect of culture that has to do with the individual person or subject. Mm -hmm. And by the objective dimension of culture, I mean that external manifestation of the reality we call culture. And depending on whether we are talking about the subjective or the objective, the definition will be different. Now, one can, by way of introduction, say that culture is a whole complex reality of the human being's attempt to adapt himself 
to the natural environment. The complex reality of the human beings attempt, attempt to, to adapt, adapt to, to the, the environment. environment. Physical, to social, environmental. Shared by other people, with other people, in con connection with other people. Because what is given by our nature in creation is just pure nature. What we make of the given is culture. Good. The raw materials we find, the fact that there are stones here and hills there and trees in some places, that is natural. But when you go to a flower but garden... That we transform those stones and trees into a house... Or a city. ...is a cultural thing. And that already shows you that so many things enter into the definition of a culture. But here, because of the context of our discussion, I want to point out that the relationship between culture and religion is more profound than it may appear in the first instance. It is so profound that some people actually do confuse culture with, with religion, religion, especially within our traditional context. When all the people had only one religion, it was easy to identify the culture with the religion. Mm -hmm. but. There are so many elements that go into the making of a culture. You mentioned language. Yes. Art. Yes. The techniques of work. Yes. The values, especially values. They are key. Yes. Institutions. Yes. And also religion. Now, religion is, I think I did mention it in the last uh, encounter, Episode, yeah. that religion is a major thread that w often weaves all these other elements into a whole. Mm -hmm. And that is why whatever touches the religion of a people will invariably affect their culture. Now, what has happened within our context? Well, we have to bear in mind that we are a young church. We are first, second, or third, third generation, generation Christians. Christians. And a hundred years may be long in the life of an individual, but it is very short period in the life of a society. And it is not often enough, except in the situation of catastrophic changes, to perceive the changes that have taken place culturally. In 100 uh, years. In 100 years, you may, yes, you perceive them, but they are not often so noticeable to the entire group, except to scholars. So I think one of the problems we have, as we said last time, is that our Christianity is yet we are putting a Christian cloak on our basic cultural convictions that are of the traditional religion. Now what needs to be done is that we as Christians have to be open to allow our faith as Christians to so permeate our culture that that same culture becomes a vehicle of the transmission of the gospel message. That is what is called in technical theological terms, inculturation. So what you are saying, in, in order to link it with what we had discussed at the first session of this uh, first episode of our uh, interview, uh, is that what we see, which some are called ab abuses, uh, in Christian practice, some aberrations, uh, some loosely call it Pentecostalism, which is actually not a very correct um, uh, identification of the issues, because uh, the, the root of those Pentecostal churches, let's say the evangelical Christians in America, for example, uh, some of them don't have the kind of abuses we are seeing here. So it means that they have been influenced, the practice of Christianity, in popular Christianity in Nigeria, has been very much influenced by the way of life of the people, which was influenced very much. The world view that the was people. influenced by the traditional, traditional African religion. religion. I will give some examples. Our traditional religion yes. is very pragmatic. Pragmatic, yes. And uh, it's a question of keeping the gods in check so that they don't cause harm. Appease them as much Appease as possible. them as much as possible, or in inverted commas, bribing them to obtain the favors 
we want. We, we want. And so we carry the same mentality into Christianity. The idea of gratuitousness, which I'm not sure you can translate very easily into, into our Nigerian language, yes. because the concept maybe may not be there easily. The idea of gratuitous love, yes. which is the central message of Christianity, is entirely new. Which we and call grace. And it must be said it is new to every culture. The novelty of Christianity is this God who is love. And so much love that he dies for the sinner. Now, this whole idea is absent in our traditional religion where things that we do in religion, in traditional religion, are always expected to bring a determined result. And when people are not finding immediate results in their relationship with God, they tend to fall back on those practices that used to give them immediate results. In traditional religion, if they didn't get immediate results with one deity, they change to another deity. And as I remember telling you the last time, if I may express it in, in an Igbo proverb, Abala madwa de yire, awayanko. When a divinity has ceased to be effective, you use it as its firewood. symbol becomes firewood. Yes. So, and then one moves on to some other thing without any qualms of conscience. And even, you see it in our Christians. I'll give you a very practical example. Our Christians at Mass, when they come for Mass, they imagine they are offering something to God in the gifts they bring. And that is why somebody coming for Thanksgiving, for instance, will bring very large envelope or a cow and go home very happy. It was a wonderful mass and he did not commune. He didn't receive communion because he's not in a state of grace. We forget that in the religion we now practice, the victim is not provided by us. The victim is God himself. Christ himself who is offered to God. All we come to do is to receive. And we often think that the more we give him, the more we receive from him. And we have turned these things into hymns. And people think that religion is all about obtaining results. It's a mentality that is in our culture. You did mention to me in one of our private conversations that uh, we, uh, our people don't even fast except when they want to obtain something. something. It's not about increasing their relationship, improving on their relationship with God or obtaining, uh, becoming holier. But just, I am fasting because I want God to heal me. I am fasting because I want to get this job. Yes. I am fasting because I want something yes. definite. So uh, I have, I, I, we need, our, uh, in our religion now, in our Christianity now, we have to begin to take more seriously the issue of the relationship between the gospel and our culture. Mm -hmm. We pre have to present the gospel in such a way that it becomes the driving force of our culture. The evolution of our, of culture. our culture. Because Pope John Paul II once did say in her, his address to the uh, professionals in Italy at a point that a, fa a faith that has not yet become culture it's is not. a faith that is not yet mature yes. because it has not been taken seriously. It's not having uh, the and, and for the benefit of our uh, viewers, when the Christian faith became culture in Europe, the institutions were affected. The family was affected all the elements of their European culture were imbued with Christian values, some of which have survived till today, and even when they are no longer practicing the And faith. that is why it is not possible for Europeans to say they are no longer Christians, even when they no longer go to church. Go to church. Because the values of Christianity have been recycled into their social, cultural, legal systems. Very simple examples. I did mention in some, other, I don't know whether, I don't remember whether it was in the last episode, that the French principles, or the principles of the French Revolution, Egalité, Egalité fraternité, Liberté, liberté yeah. they are Christian values yes. 
They never existed in European culture before Christianity. Even one of their leading philosophers, Hegel, did say that it was Christianity that taught the world the freedom of the individual yes. and the dignity of every single individual, mm -hmm. even the sinner or the lawbreaker. Yes. So, and the, we cannot perceive our fraternity except we have the concept of one fatherhood. Yes. And that is one father. And that is not in any culture. It's only in that religion that says we are all children of the same father, not because we are begotten by blood, but of all those who believed in him, he gave the power of to becoming become the children, children of, of God. God, not generated in blood, but by the spirit. So that fatherhood of God is the only thing that gives us the ground to say we are all brothers and we are all equal. Of course, we know. We are not equal physically, we are not equal socially, but we are equal in dignity because all created in the image of God. Oh God. Mm -hmm. And that's the only place we are really equal. Mm -hmm. So these are Christian values that they have appropriated and now secularized. Yes. They have appropriated Christian values and secularized them and are attempting to push Christianity aside. I'll give you another very simple, very much more simple example. In many parts of Europe, it is part of their traffic law that if you come to the scene of a road accident, you must, must offer stop. some help. In Germany, for instance, a, while Nigerian police will check your car, fire extinguisher here, the German police will check whether you have the first aid kit. First aid kit. But that is the parable of the Good Samaritan that has now become law. Now institutionalized. Has become law. So these are the things, but it didn't happen in one day. Emperors had to become Christians, and princes had to become Christians, and they then used the powers they had to, to make Christian values obligatory to the people, for the people. Well, we may quarrel about their methods, but we can see the result it has obtained. That if people adapted these values, and the first to begin to make that attempt seriously on an institutional level was Constantine. Yeah when he became a Christian, when he acquired some sympathy for Christianity. Nobody really knows whether he, he actually, actually became, became a Christian. But he had a lot of sympathy for Christianity and then gradually began to bring in Christian values because he saw that those values kept the people more coerced, more linked to one another than all the things contained in the Roman laws. For more than 70 years now, many parts of Europe maybe not up to 15, 20, 30 percent of Christians go to church. And yet, what Bishop Ona is saying is that the Christian values that formed their culture, their culture became Christian. Uh, it, 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 you can now see it in, so monogamy became law. Charity became law. Brotherly concern became law. All kinds of things now became uh, part of the culture. Courtesy, simple courtesy, compassion became part of the culture. Meaning that if the gospel is really doing what it should do, transform a people, years after even the person stops going to church, it continues to affect the practice of the people. If you watch the architectural layout of most European cities, yes. you find they have centers. Every city has a center. Mm -hmm. At the center of the city is a church. Yes. And this mm -hmm. goes deep down into the formation of the mentality of the people. Mm -hmm. Now, what does a church represent for the city? Is the point of reference. Yes. That point where God intervenes in human chaos and gives some orientation and some sense of balance. One old German woman once told me that the only thing that gave them hope during the, the Second World War while, was that whereas Cologne was constantly coming under bombardment, bombardment from the Allied forces, each time they woke up, and they, they looked, looked up at the dome. and saw the dome still standing. Yes, that meant hope. Cologne was not yet, mm. had not yet collapsed. Mm. So this point, this set, the church that provided a point of reference for the people even if now they no longer go to, ch to churches, that had become 
a point of reference for their architecture, a point of the reference for their city development, a point of for reference tourism. for their aggregation, and then now for tourism. tourism. I mean, I, I live economy. briefly in, Ka in Aachen, the city of Chalamain. And um, you see the rat house, meaning the, um, what do you call it, the council building. The council building. And then the dome, meaning the church. The church. So the center the where road. people gather, uh, the church becomes the center where that rallies people round. It's also not just physical center, but ideological uh, center where people gather. It's in our own society, it's like the town hall. So the church is like the town hall. Um, this is very important, your analysis of, of the dynamics of culture and, and religion, what role religion has to play and what role culture has to play. But How? may I add quickly yes. that here, of all the elements that enter into a culture, into the definition of a culture, so many can change. Yeah. But the ones that will determine whether a culture is going up or, or going, going down, down are the values. Values. The values. What are the things for which a person is prepared to die? Values. The values. And Unless our values as a people, as Nigerians, as Nigerian Christians, unless our values are being shaped by the gospel, no matter how full our churches are, we have not yet become Christians. Hmm. This is serious. I mean, for viewers, he says, unless our values are Christian, no matter how full our churches are, we have not yet become Christian. And what are the dangers of this? Does it mean that uh, churches are full today and seminaries are full and so on? If our values in, are not Christian... In 1984 or 85, fresh from ordination, I did a reflection that I still stand by now. It was a title that was given, proposed to me by the Presbyterium and I reflected around it. The title says, Baptized but not converted, hmm. informed but not transformed. not transformed, learned but not educated. Can this be said of the majority of Nigerian Christians today? And the answer is yes. Baptized but not converted. Not converted. Christianity is about a change of attitude. It is about a conversion of heart. You see, I get worried by all these applauses that we receive, by all this applause that we receive as, as, as preachers. Because when Peter preached, they asked, applause. brethren, what, what must, must we, we, do, we now? do now? Transformation. Transformation. Is Christianity an agent of transformation in Nigeria? What we have is that a we have a form of Christianity that is confirming the misery of our people, soothing them and providing comfort for the rich. Marx did say it, that Christianity, religion is meant through charity to provide consolation for the rich and through miracles to provide consolation for the poor. The rich will soothe their conscience when they give. Some pittance. After having stolen billions, they give millions and we clap and they are okay. And of course, the poor receive handouts or they receive some miracles and they are okay. But there is no change of attitude. There is no transformation. Nigeria keeps getting the premium of being the most religious country in the world and yet most corrupt. How do you combine these two? I mean, when, when Jesus met Zacchaeus, when he encountered Zacchaeus, instantly there was a transformation because Zacchaeus got up and said, that if I have cheated anyone, I will refund fourfold and I will give half my property to the poor. The, it's clear evidence of instant transformation. It is true that in most of us, the transformation will not be as dramatic as, as that, that of, of that Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus or even that of Paul. Yes. But some constant openness to, to transformation, transformation should be there. Our Christians don't care, so long as they get their problems solved. That is why it does not matter to us how corrupt our brother is when he is in office and is satisfying our own needs. We don't feel ashamed 
of the corrupt practices of Christian leaders, for instance. And it is becoming commonplace, normal. Mm. And unfortunately, if, if we don't take this thing seriously enough, we produce a version of Christianity that will become a caricature of the gospel. Well, I am afraid that we have already, we already have today, in the popular Christianity of Nigeria, in the popular practice in Nigeria from north to south, from east to west, actually a caricature of Christianity. This is my worry. And part of this program is to be constantly reflecting on true authentic Christianity. And we have a cloud of witnesses through history to, as evidence. And then to look at our own society and see churches that are full and see the conduct of the people to say, hey, where, where are we going? This is, this is part of the reason why we have programs like this, and I'm happy that uh, you are here to actually make this in a very lucid you know, uh, manner, help our uh, viewers, help us to really understand that what we are dealing with is very critical to our survival, our entire enterprise as Christians. It is critical to it. Remember I said last time, I ended on this note, that we should have the courage to let those who want to go leave. Those who want to leave our churches. Want to go, yes, those who want to go. Those who are tired of being Catholic just because we are not peddling miracles, because we are not watering down the teachings of Christ, because we are not presenting Christianity as existing only to solve our practical problems. If that is all you expect of Christianity, well, Jesus said, what of you? Do you want to go to... Are you also, will you also not go away? You see... Christianity is not, the gospel message is not a mass movement. Hmm. We, we, we shouldn't be behaving like people in a political rally. Who want crowd the crowd. Especially a Nigerian political rally anyway, where millions will gather at your rally and vote for the next, your opponent. Because the number, that's another mistake our politicians are making because they think the number of people at their rallies uh, shows the number of supporters they, they have. have. They're expecting something they will gain from your rally. When it comes to put, voting, they would vote for whom they want. And it's also c correct that it be so. But we are not in a mass movement. Christianity is about individuals and their salvation yes. and their conversion. And it is only when those individuals collectively assume it as a responsibility to transform themselves and, and, as their, and their, cult, uh, their environment, their society, then it becomes a cultural movement. Well, we will uh, take a break at this moment and then we will come back and take it on from here about uh, Christianity being a religion of the individual and the, and the collection of those individuals uh, is something very enlightening that I will want our leaders, uh, our re uh, viewers, viewers to be benefit from when we come back. Let's take a break. Get behind me, Satan, I've had enough of sin. Get behind me, Satan, I've seen the light of Christ. Get behind me, Satan, Jesus calls on me. I'm giving my life to Christ. Get behind me, Satan, I've had enough of sin. Get behind me, Satan, I've seen the light of Christ. Get behind me, Satan, Jesus calls on me. I've given my life to Christ. Get behind me, Satan, you're an obstacle on my way. Get behind me, Satan, I'm tired of darkness. Get behind me, Satan, I'll always reject you. I'm giving my life to Christ. Get behind me, Satan, I'll always reject you. I'm giving my life to Get behind me, Satan, I want no more of you. 
Get behind me, Satan, I've been set free to leave. Get behind me, Satan, I'm now a child of God. I've given my life to Get behind me, Satan, I want no more of you. Get behind me, Satan, I've been set free to leave. Get behind me, Satan, I'm now a child of God. I'm giving my life to Christ. Yes, I'm now a child of God. I've given my life to Christ. I say I'm now a child of God. I've given my life to Christ. Welcome back to Reflections. I have uh, Bishop uh, Godfrey Honor of uh, Onsuka Diocese with me. Um, by the way, Bishop Honor uh, was Professor of Philosophy uh, at the Pontifical Urban University in Rome for many years and uh, um, became the Bishop of Onsuka Diocese. And now he's uh, using his professorial knowledge and experience to teach us, um, instruct us on what is really happening. I have benefited so well from the analysis of culture and the dynamics of religion and culture. At the point at which we took a break, he was talking about um, the nature of Christianity. Christianity is not a mass movement. You may have millions of people, but it is about individuals and their transformation and their salvation. Well, when those individuals gather together that form a church, but we are baptized as individuals. You never have a priest go to the marketplace and pour water on all of you. I baptize all of you. It still take one after the other. Joseph, I baptize you, and so on. Samuel, I baptize you. And Jesus himself said, a good shepherd knows his sheep by, by name. name and calls them one by, by one, one and leads them out, yes. and they, they follow him. Uh, just a little aside, you said something which I'm using my professorial knowledge. Uh, it's rather the other way around. All my... 21 years as a teacher in the university in Rome, I had one thing clear in my head, that I, that I am a priest. Correct. And I told my students that I am a philosophy teacher, but primarily a priest. priest. And if God called me to the priesthood, it wasn't to teach philosophy. It was to be a but priest. But to preach, preach the gospel. Praise the Lord. And so that I was using the teaching, reflection on philosophy and its teaching as a means of preaching the gospel. gospel. And the moment I found out I could no longer do that, I would resign. From teaching. It was clear in, clear in my head. So it's really my own understanding of my faith. My own understanding of my faith. I don't deny that my academic formation and my professional experience are a help. But I have had very deep reflections and discussions with my mother, who didn't go beyond standard two. And you find a deep theological thought that you would not get in many of the uh, uh, professional theologians sometimes. So I think it's rather is really about what we think about our faith, whom we think Jesus is for us. Yes, where, our, is where us. our faith is in our worldview. Um, you know, this comes up generally now and again when people come to me 
to discuss about who they want to marry. Uh, I want to marry this person, but Father, we are not of the same faith. Sorry, so, before we go to that, yeah. let me quickly add something about Christianity being about Man. individuals and their salvation. Yes. This should not be taken out of the con out of context of Christ's own command that we love one another. Mm -hmm. And that also means that to love one another, there has to be the other for you to love. Yes. And Paul's image of the church as a body, and no single individual constitutes the body of Christ. Yes. So saying it, it's not a mass movement that is about individuals is just to emphasize that we should not lose the value of the individual when we are chasing after the mass, yes. the number, yes. the crowd, and building larger churches, and people are not getting converted. Yes. So that's, that is, yeah. I, no, no, I, without I think... diminishing the value of the corporate hmm. Uh, yeah. Actually, we, we, we were, I thought we were emphasizing the individual transformation over and above the desire to have crowds and crowds. And the crowd we have in church should be a collection of individual Christians. We're convinced yes. about their faith. Individuals that are convinced of the faith. Because we have this strange phenomenon in the Catholic Church, peculiar to Catholics, Wherever Catholics are in the majority in Nigeria, that is where you feel the influence of Catholicism less. Hmm. Or least. Where they are in the majority, you... Things I, are taken for granted. I told people in my diocese that I want to give Nsoka a Catholic identity. And they were wondering, do you want everybody to be a Catholic? I said, no, I know that we are already a majority here. But I want it to be, I want us to be majority in such a way that somebody who comes to Insoka for the first time would not need to ask what religion is the majority here. Let him perceive it by our conduct. Let him perceive that we are Catholics by our conduct. Why is that so difficult? It was so in Ireland at a point. It is still so in Poland. It is so in the Philippines. You don't need to ask them their religion. You see it. You see it in their conduct. Yes. So uh, that is the thing I am worried about our numbers, about number, because the individual is lost in the crowd. Well, you see, you see our religion by the noise we make. I mean, we see our religion by the fact that by 12 o'clock in Onicha, the bell goes for angelos. Well, <laughs> is that not Catholic identity? Yes, but you know, I don't know how far that is still going on, because let me tell you something. That Angelus that people said at 12 o'clock, I used to make fun of it by telling them immediately after the Angelus. What do you do? And one man, a stranger who is not from our nature, let us take a house man, strays into your shop, and immediately you are able to sell to him what you would ordinarily sell for 200 naira, you sell it to the Aboki for 500 naira or 1,000 naira. And you will thank God that he has had your Angelus. Now the Angelus has been replaced by what they call, is it ministration or what? Before taking off for business every morning, you find groups, little groups of Christians gathered with clutching their Bible and praying and praying, asking God to send them a fool to cheat. Oh, asking them to send... Oh, what else are they praying for? <laughs> for good business. But good business that day means that they cheat their brothers. You find people who have no business in the wharf. And they are loitering there and they are praying to God to make their business good so that they find things to steal. People who kidnapped my mother were praying and they were playing the record of one of the famous healers in our area and asking God, he told my brother when he overheard them that we are Christians, so it's not our fault. So we're asking God's protection. Well, of course, we have stories of arm robbers and kidnappers uh, kneeling down to... Uh, Ask Father to bless, to bless them. After robbing After Father. robbing them. So this, <laughs> the, where does this type of Christianity take us to? 
And uh, why, why my, what marvels me is that we seem to be comfortable with it. I mean, we're so comfortable with it that once upon a time in this country, we had a well-known person carry the Bible to a traditional shrine. And he said, look, uh, well, yes, I went to swear in a shrine, but I carried the Bible there. I mean, it's uh, meaning uh, all kinds of contradictions, really, that we are becoming very comfortable with, you know. So uh, at this stage in our discussion, how do we now begin to turn around, turn around our culture, turn around our, our, in, our, in the evolution of our faith so that we'll be going in the right direction, now, such that will positively influence our culture? This is not a very simple question to answer because it's the entire business of our lifetime. But I'll tell you what I suspect happened. Some priests were too quick in a very shallow form of enculturation by using the basic world views in our tradition and bringing them into religion, into Catholicism. I'll give you an example. Cleansing the family roots. Hmm. I don't know whether I've heard of that. In many parts of Nigeria, a priest will tell you you are not progressing in business or you have been having series of death in your family because there was a sin that your forefathers committed, committed. that needs to be cleansed before you begin to have a They call it ancestral sins or ancestral causes and, or something. And people buy into this and do all sorts of funny rituals to cleanse the family roots. And I asked them a very simple question. If baptism forgives the sin of Adam and all the consequences, how wouldn't it then forgive the sins sin of, your of your ancestors? Some of them, some of whom were sins of ignorance, less than the sin of Adam that was clear disobedience. So now I think by the time a priest does that, then on their own, our uh, people add so many other elements. Because the priest has reinforced. Yeah, has reinforced that, that mm -hmm. worldview. And look at what is happening with the so-called sacramentals now. We are in a jungle of sacramentals in Nigeria where anything from handkerchief to balm to granite oil and the so-called olive oil blessed in any way has olive oil. All those oils have become anointing oil, even for Catholics who know what anointing oil should, should be. be. And priests use that for them and they think then, they take the place of okay. charms. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Before you know it, you take a sticker from a ministry and you put it at your door to You're protect protected it from thieves. You take a, 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 an olive oil and you surround your house with it before you build it, protect it from thieves and from all your enemies. And do you blame the people? So I think on the level of leadership, for, especially by priests in the Catholic Church, we have to begin to do very serious mm. reflection. The author of the letter to the Hebrews wanted to make Christ's message relevant to his people. Yes. And he went to the Old Testament and pulled out instances in the Old Testament that he would use as references to what Christ, as preparations for what Christ did. We have to do that with our culture. God gave our ancestors means of doing his will not as clearly as he did to the prophets of the Old Testament, but he didn't leave them without any guide. We have to get deep down into our culture and fish out the values that mm -hmm. guided our people. Yes. There was a time when I was still young that it was an abomination for an Igbo man to steal. In many parts of this country. I'm talking of the culture I know. And if an Igbo man stole a good, it will be hung on his neck and people would make caricature of him. And now we give titles, even in the church, to the greatest thieves we have in this country. Well, part of it is that we don't call them thieves. We say the person is corrupt. It looks like the word corruption is too big a word that our people don't know the meaning. So well, that's why some people have suggested that we should replace corruption. We say, this person is a thief. 
<laughs> so I think we have to begin to do very serious reflections about the values in our culture that we appoint as, as the classical theological term, semina verbi, the seeds of the gospel mm -hmm. in our own culture. Our people's love for truth and justice and equity, it was not for nothing. Our people's fellow feeling. Yes. We had very, such a fellow feeling that your brother or cousin had a right to your things. Yes. Now, all we need to do with that concept is to extend the concept of brotherhood. To become universal. To become, because we are all children of one yes. God, we are all brothers mm. and sisters. Now we are using it to restrict the concept of brotherhood. I mean, when you bring in ethnicity. Yes. When, you think, when you think of the crass individualism among us today, when you think of it and how destructive it is, and you just look back a couple of decades, and you see that our people were known for communalism. Even in our architecture, you see, how where we have failed on so many fronts. See the modern houses, the way they are built, and fenced around with barbed wires and electrified uh, wires. This is a people whose um, grandfathers lived and they had ra uh, round cycled places wait, where wait, the various... Wait a minute. When I was a boy, if a house was on fire, and often houses were because yes, they were no. built with straw. Yes. Once there was a shout of emergency, Everybody all able-bodied men in the village would run to that place. The women would draw water and people would risk their lives to, put to save that, yeah. what was savable from yes. that house. Today, when a house is on fire, people will try to loot as much as they can from that house. Yeah. Yeah. How much? Because, we because so our yeah. values, yes. our values, the things we are transmitting, the things we are bringing into the church are the worst of us. And instead of allowing the gospel to transform, I always tell people, many things we are doing in the church now are European, but they were adopted by the church, purified by the church, and they became universal. Only the Catholic Church has the possibility and the capacity of, of making cultural values universal, universal values because it is a universal institution. And this is our turn. This is actually supposed to be the age of Africa. Look at the first synod, the first synod for, of bishops for Africa that celebrated the fact that it is now our turn to dig into those values, those uh, lasting values in our heritage that we will now bring and make universal. And while we, we are celebrating that in Rome, you the, Rwanda, the, Rwanda the Rwandans were massacring their brothers and sisters yes. in the name of ethnic identity and yes. difference. Yes. You see, there is a basic contradiction going on in our lives as Nigerians and Africans that we must address as church. We must address this at church. And if we are not doing that, the numbers will increase. But the priests will increase. The bishops and dioceses will increase. But we will not get more Christian. Hmm. This is frightening. This is really frightening. It's not frightening. It's challenging. Challenging. Remember I told you once that one beautiful thing I like about Nigerians is that the word problem, problem is, no longer is there. being replaced by challenge. Yes. Problem has a way of crippling you. But challenge, challenge has a way of motivating you. Yes. So it's a challenge. Yes. I think we have to see it. This is a time for us. Before those values disappear completely. completely. Before no one even remember. At least you can say when I was young. Now before those values uh, disappear, it is time for us to begin to, first of all, even document them. I had the... Appreciate them sufficiently. Yes, yes. I, I had the uh, uh, privilege of studying a particular value or a set of values in my place, which I call Ozovehe. And it, 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 it's a name that actually means, uh, 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 points to the value of the human person, the dignity of the human person before God. And how I, I, I did the work with Imago Dei, you know. So it means that in every, that's one tiny little area of our culture. In every area of our life, how we look for something wonderful, something good that we could actually, using the gospel of Christ, sell to the world so that it becomes a universal Christian much, value. 
much as I appreciate the type of music we hear in some churches now, like the one I heard in your chaplain on Sunday, can you imagine how impoverished our traditional music has become? Because it is no longer being protected. Yes. And the Catholic Church has the capacity of adopting yes. that genre of music, of music and making it liturgical, yes. purifying it, yes. using... Look, the battle was fought in Europe. We just think that these things happened overnight. No, they didn't. There was a time in the history of Europe when only chants were permitted in the church. Yes. Polyphonic music and clapping Absolutely and not. were not permitted. And you remember, a man like Augustine, who came from another context, yes. was arguing for the use of a different type of music in the church, whereas other theologians we are insisting that only the, to be. only the commoners could do that. It wasn't dignified enough for the liturgy. That is perhaps the background for Augustine's statement that he who sings well prays twice. Prays twice yes. So people had to, theologians in the past suffered discrimination, misunderstanding, name calling when they were trying to do this for their own culture. When Christianity, when the gospel message comes in contact with, with culture. any culture, the values are turned yes. upside down. Yes, there's a creative conflict. There is a creative conflict. conflict. Yes. Jesus did it for the Jews. The apostles did it for the rest of the Jews and also for the Greeks. Yes. And eventually for the rest of Europe. This is, this is a discussion on enculturation proper. Uh, a lot of people have all kinds of understanding about enculturation. Uh, people have debated about adaptation, about acculturation, about contextualization, and enculturation. What Bishop has been discussing is actually pointing our direction towards serious theological reflection on, on values. values. Father George, sorry to be so passionate about this, but any time you think of enculturation in Nigeria, the first thing that strikes you is music in the church. Mm. And you go for a celebration and they use cultural elements. They bring girls dressed in a way that nobody dresses any, anymore. And they tell you it is, is cultural. Culture. They do things in my place. I ask them, where does where this make meaning mm. anymore in our, to our people? This is just a creative invention of one artist and they tell you it is cultural. cultural. And the values, the values our people cherish so much. We have lost Respect them. for elders, yeah. for instance. A critical element of our culture. Respect for, for elders. elders, for instance. Yes. And now that children find it difficult to stand up for elders, we have that because they have been taught in another culture that children also have rights, and I agree. I have no doubt for that about that. But you find children who come to church in the rural setting, and they occupy the seats, and their parents come, and they have to stand. But you forget that those parents had to wash the children and dress them up and send them to church before getting ready themselves. Yes. If they had to take care of themselves only, they wouldn't be yes. later for yes. the church. Yes. That is why a responsible child, even if he's not his own parent, will yes. know. Well, Once he sees the, uh, the an elder, elder you say, okay, I can stand while you sit. But it's no longer that way. On this note, we will bring this discussion to a close uh, with full gratitude to uh, uh, Bishop uh, uh, Honor. Uh, the whole issue is the challenge of digging out from our culture, from our various cultures, digging out values that are godly values, if we may put it that way, godly values embedded in our cultures, which we are neglecting and we are losing fast. Now, we all, all Christians, not just professional theologians, all Christians have the responsibility to identify. After reading the gospel, you identify uh, mutual respect, communalism, family, 
I mean, the African Synod emphasized um, uh, family, the church as family. Now, how we identify all those values? Because our survival, the survival of, of Christianity will depend on these values, these values that could easily be linked to our own society, to our own uh, culture and, and, and traditions, so that we use them to build institutions that will last, institutions that will ensure the survival of our Christian faith for hundreds and thousands of years to come. Uh, Bishop, you have taken us to an area that we may need to have several sessions, several episodes in future. Uh, I am very grateful, and I'm sure our viewers are very grateful for this enlightenment. If I can add just one more statement. Yes. Drawing from my Igbo context, the Igbos have a statement which, when translated, will tell you that truth is life, is yokubundu. They, will have, they have a statement that will tell you Ozamaka, that is the road, the way is very beautiful. Maybe when somebody has received something along the way, they have a statement that will tell you, Ndub, we see life first. Mm -hmm. And Christ comes and tells you, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Combining all those principles yes. in one person. Yes. So our people have to know that those things they we have already in their there. culture, they have in their culture, we are referring to yes. the person of Christ. Yes. We have to help our people to realize that so, so that I mean, they don't see Christianity anymore as a strange religion. A strange religion. Yes. I mean, I, I keep getting this, this, getting upset when people come and say they are going for their white wedding, meaning they are going for the sacrament of matrimony. They, are, they, they consider that they are already married, but that the church says we should come for a white wedding. Now, that tells you how far we are from this inculturation you are talking about. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Bishop, and uh, we would have opportunity to meet again for a third episode because we, can't, we cannot end it here. I'm sure our viewers will be looking for more. Uh, it's been great having you in our uh, reflections, and uh, I look forward to a third episode. Thank you very Thank much, you very much. Thank and you, and uh, congratulations for the service. Thank you for the service you are rendering to the people of God. Thank you very much. And God bless you. Amen. Thank you. And bless the viewers too. Yes.